mess me up. Thank you. Good evening, ladies. Yeah, this was the time I uh, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Good evening. Folks, if I may have your attention. Thank you. I think somebody's tapping the glass and we all have to kiss somebody. I'm not sure how that works. Welcome to the Bronx Soaker Awards 2015. This is my, my favorite event of the year and it's a wonderful event filled with wonderful people. So I'm so glad to see everyone here. Uh, before we get started with the Stoker Awards, uh, it is my great pleasure to be able to um, extend uh, from something the, the World Horror Association gave its Grandmaster Award to William F. Knoll, one of the greatest writers in the world. And I have the great honor of being able to hand that award to Bill, one of my favorite writers since I was a little bit. Really Thank Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, and that's what I feel like. Doing. Anyway, I'll start out by saying how boring it is to hear to somebody like me make some boring speech when you're trying to eat, you want dessert. The last thing I want to know, Mr. Nolan is fine, let's clap for him and get him back to his seat. Because I hate going to the Oscars and they say, well, I want to thank my wife's dentist. I want to thank the first grade teacher that I ever had, Miss Olive Hardy of West. With, and she's in Wisconsin now. I want to thank my great uncle, Brian. He's, he's in, I think he's in Australia. We haven't heard from him for a while. I have another 40 people that I'd like to thank in alphabetical order. And I said, oh, God. You know, I'm dying watching this thing. I, I want to know what the picture of the year is, what the best actor is, what the best. I don't care about his grandmother or his dentist. I really I don't want to hear it. So, I'm not going to do any of that. I'm just going to say thank you to every living thing on the planet Earth. <laughs> Very briefly, I want to say that I love the story. I don't know where I heard it first, but I've always loved the story. This little girl, she's about eight years old, and she loves elephants. She thinks elephants are wonderful. She has little elephant statues and pictures of elephants on the wall and everything. And so her father says, I'm going to do a wonderful thing for my little daughter. I'm going to bring her a book on elephants, a big book of elephants, it's called. So he gives a big book of elephants to a little girl who can barely can't carry it back to her bedroom. And pretty soon the door opens, and about an hour later, and she comes out and hands the book back to her father. And her father says, why are you doing this? And she said, because this book told me more about elephants than I care to know. <laughs> The speech from me would tell you more than you care to know about what you're not knowing. So you won't have to abide that and you won't have to suffer through it. Finally, I had a, uh, see, I had a, I had a three part thing here. The little girl, I got rid of her. Thank you, the people on the planet Earth, I got rid of that. And what was my, th oh, I know what it was. This woman comes up to me and says, How does it feel to be Grand Master? And I said, Hmm. She said, Tell me, how you, I said, I can do it in one word. She says, what is it? Grand. So thank all of you. Thank all of you. Yeah. And now, to kick off the Brown Stoker Awards, I would like to introduce our president, Lisa Morton. Thank you, Jonathan. Good evening, and 
Thank you, Alex. I'll take the Bram Stoker Awards for 600. <laughs> you know, we can laugh about that now only because in the past, and that is the very recent past, the idea of a category devoted to horror literature awards appearing on one of the most popular game shows in the world would have been pretty unimaginable. Uh, there it was, three months ago, Jeopardy was asking its contestants about Stephen King and Joe Hill and Joss Whedon and some graphic novel called Witch Hunts. I think there can only be one explanation for seeing the Bram Stoker Awards as a category on Jeopardy, and that is that horror is thriving. Yay. Our genre is a category on game shows. It's appearing again on lists from major publishers. It's taken over our television screens. And it's been a really long time now since I've checked into an internet forum and seen that dreaded question, is horror dead? Surely there can be no better indication that our Bram Stoker Awards have come of age. We're no longer that weird kid who's buried in the back of the bookshelf, or on the third page of the blurbs. Or is on the rise again, and the Bram Stoker Awards and HWA are rising with it. Our membership is stronger than ever, variety and depth of our programs. Everything we offer from four different scholarships, to library outreach, to major appearances at trade shows and book festivals has never been greater. We've taken our first steps into digital self-publishing, even while we were securing a major deal for our next anthology with Simon & Schuster. Now we have other writers' organizations coming to us for advice and collaboration. HWA owes much of that remarkable growth over the last four years to one amazing man, Rocky Wood. Rocky had just entered his third term as HWA's president when he passed away in December. And it was his vision and tireless dedication that brought the organization to its new heights. I've already addressed Rocky's brilliant legacy elsewhere. Uh, I urge anyone unfamiliar with his achievements to please visit horror.org, our website. And it's not my intention to mourn him here tonight because frankly he was a guy who loved life. And I think he would have wanted us to celebrate. So in that spirit of celebration, it's my privilege and my great pleasure to unveil Rocky's final project. If you saw those little teases on Facebook, here it comes. Something that he and I have worked on for the last year, and that we think is a significant step forward for HWA. Although we are tremendously grateful to the World Horror Society and to the committees who have run the World Horror Conventions that we've been a part of over the years, Time has come for HWA to stand on its own and manage its own yearly event, one centered around our iconic awards. So we hope you will join us in welcoming StokerCon, beginning... <laughs> it just made Rocky very happy, so. Beginning in 2016, horror lovers will have a new yearly event to add to their calendars. And with the resources of HWA behind it, we think we can make StokerCon a must-see. Our first event, StokerCon 2016, will take place May 7th through May 10th in one of the most exciting cities in the world, Las Vegas. We will be occupying the legendary and very haunted Flamingo Hotel. Our lineup of guests promises to encompass the entire world of horror, including Mr. Jack Ketchum, <laughs> Leslie Klinger, the author of the annotated H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> we will have Daniel Knopf, the creator of HBO's Carnival. <laughs> Our Toastmaster will be joining us all the way from Britain, the inimitable and irascible Stephen Jones. And we will have Mr. Goosebumps himself, R.L. Stein.
But that's not all, because we also have 2017 already planned. We invite you to join us in the city of Long Beach, California, home of the Queen Mary, and just 40 minutes from Los Angeles and Hollywood, where our first guest of honor is George R. R. Martin. Our website for StokerCon 2016 will be live in just a few more days with tickets on sale at special or early bird prices. We have a lot more surprises still in store for everyone, and we hope you will join us in Vegas. And uh, speaking of those stokers, it's time to get down to the cool business of handing out these awards. So without further ado, I'm turning this over to our own Alex Trebek, Jeff Strand. <laughs> Uh, welcome to the Stokers, and how about those Hugo Awards? <laughs> you know, that kind of puts any Stoker bickering into perspective. You know, most awards conflicts tend to be, hey, I know that the books I read were better than the ones I didn't read. But you know, we're horror. We should be the ones having the apocalyptic battles. You know, the Hugos have the sad puppies and the rat puppies. We should be having the Cujo Strike Force. <laughs> Anyway, welcome to the 28th Annual Bram Stoker Awards Banquet. This year we are celebrating a quarter century of the World Horror Convention. The first convention I ever attended in my life was World Horror Convention 1995 right here in Atlanta, 20 years ago. I hadn't published a single word of fiction, I dressed way worse, and it was incredible. I went around getting people to sign a vomit bag. <laughs> this vomit bag. <laughs> now, most of the people who signed it aren't here tonight, but Mike Garnson. <laughs> I had never gotten to hang out with real authors before, and I got to sit with Mike when he was talking about the new book he was working on, which was absolutely mind-blowing. We were in the bar late at night, and he said, if your tongue started to grow inside of your mouth, what could cause that? <laughs> and one guy said, maybe you had a secret that you desperately needed to share, but couldn't. And Mike said, actually, in the book, it's from toad licking. <laughs> and that kind of conversation is what the World War Convention is all about. <laughs> Twenty minutes ago, while I was pacing around nervously, Kristen Dearborn said, If your significant other's hand was in a pile of severed hands, would you be able to recognize it? <laughs> Show of hands. Would you be able to recognize your significant other? All right, about 50-50. And that is also what the World War Convention is all about. So congratulations. And also, look, my wife, the first time we met, signed here too. Aww. Because I'm certainly not going to reference Mike Arnson and not her. <laughs> Bram Stoker Awards wore a category on Jeopardy. The last question was for $1,000. The answer was horror writers. The question, which group looks the hottest at an awards bank? Guy <laughs> Will Pander. Every year, it's my tradition to do a little joke saying, hey, people in the horror community, stop dying, save the death of your books. Ah. But sometimes I feel like to keep this banquet from running too long, I have to pay tribute to the people who didn't die in the last year. So Jonathan Mayberry, still with us. Aaron Kemper, not dead. Lisa Morton's still around, but keep checking on her. <laughs> and HWA President Rocky Wood died this year from Lou Gehrig's disease. And we can all say we knew it was coming, but none of us did. I thought he was going to be at my funeral, telling me to get out of that grave, you lazy bum. Where's your horror selfie? <laughs> With us tonight is one of this year's Lifetime Achievement Award winners, Jack Ketchum.
One of my greatest regrets is that I did not get to read his incredibly disturbing novel, The Girl Next Door, thinking it was about a skeleton cheerleader. <laughs> because I envy the people who picked up the book with that goofy cover and thought, oh, this looks like can't be fun. Off to kind of a somber beginning, but I'm sure there'll be skeleton cheerleaders any page now. <laughs> Where's the 2468? <laughs> I'm sure there's a happy ending. <laughs> this is what I want to do this film. <laughs> okay, it's a little embarrassing to admit this. Uh, we can't afford to pay for this ceremony in its entirety, so I'm asking everybody to contribute to our Stoker's 2015 Indiegogo campaign so the winners can keep their trophies. <laughs> The $25 perk level creepy lingering hugs. <laughs> and I don't have a joke for this, but our official hashtag is Stokers2015 if you're posting anything on Twitter that you like. If you don't, pick a different hashtag. <laughs> Lots of clowns in the news since we last met. The Clowns of America International spoke out against the latest season of American Horror Story, which featured Twisty the Clown. The association's president said, we do not support in any way, shape, or form any medium that sensationalizes or adds to chlorophobia or clown fear. And I read that article and all I could think was, oh my God, we've angered the clowns. <laughs> but we've also got the Poltergeist remake which has a much scarier clown doll than the original. So scary that it's kind of irrelevant if it even comes to life in the movies, because the psychological damage to the children is already done. You know, the It remake just announced the new Pennywise. Why are we doing this? We'll give in to North Korea, but we're going to defy the clowns? <laughs> Nothing's happened yet, but they're patient. They will stand in your closet for months. You know, we also don't worry enough about the economic damage that monsters could cause. Think of how many TV reality show jobs would be lost if Bigfoot just came out and said, Here I am! <laughs> the ripple effect would be devastating. You can't do a show about looking at spirit orbs if Bob the Ghost is doing a press conference. And you may be saying, you know, well, you just give the ghosts and the aliens their own reality shows, and then the crews that were employed on the previous shows would then move to the new shows. And my answer to that is, yes, I do not think this bit the rules for <laughs> So technically, we are not going to suffer economic collapse if all the monsters reveal their existence to the world. We only have to worry about the clowns. <laughs> all right. As always, to keep things on stage from devolving into chaos and confusion, we have somebody to give the correct trophies to those of you who are presenting. So please welcome tonight's stoker, hand router, Jody Renee Lester. A change in the usual process. We don't have a microphone stand, and the podium is kind of at a slope, and you're going to be dealing with an envelope. So to keep the instances of stokers falling to the stage at a minimum, she's not going to give you the trophy until the winner is announced. And now we're going to begin. From verses about ghosts, witches, vampires, and a raven with a one-word vocabulary that just won't shut up, some of our genre's most iconic images come from poetry. Presenting the award for superior achievement in poetry, please welcome the author of How to Recognize a Demon Has Become Your Friend, joined by the author of At Loose Ends, Poetry for the Decadent, the Damned, and the Absent-Minded, Linda Addison and Maria Alexander. <laughs> to um, point out that poetry was honored with the first Bram Stoker Award in the year 2000. And that was given to Tom Piccarelli, who was a guest of honor, but wasn't able to attend. So we want to send our best wishes to Tom. Today, we are 
announcing the 15th anniversary of the Poetry Award. Hello. No. Oh, there it is. Okay, a little bit. Um, so today, this is the 15th Poetry Award. So from <laughs> Stick it in the water. It says it's on. Turn off. Is that one? Right up Right here. Okay. All right, so this is the 15th year of the Bram Stoker Poetry Award, and we're now seeing nominees that span the globe. The nominees for Superior Achievement in a Poetry Collection are Robert Payne Cabine, Fear Worms, Selected Poems. Corinne de Winter and Alessandro Manzetti, Venus Intervention. <laughs> Tom Piccarilli, Forgiving Judas. Marge Simon and Mary Terzillo, Sweet Boys. Finally, Stephanie Vitovich, Morning Jewelry. <laughs> and the winner is Tom Piccarelli for Living <laughs> I don't know if he's given a to anyone, but okay, I'm going to accept this for him. <laughs> because I love him. And I love him. And I know that he would be like beside himself and happy and joyful and jumping up and down on a jazz. So thank you all. Classic examples of horror themed nonfiction include On Writing, Dark Dreamers, and, in a little-known fact, the entire bibliography of Edward Lee. <laughs> you do not want to be there during the research. <laughs> Presenting the award for Superior Achievement in Nonfiction, please welcome the author of Grave Markings, joined by the author of Return of the Mothman, Mike Arnson and Michael Noss. Nonfiction comes in uh, a lot of categories. There's books on craft, biographies of writers, letters by writers, works of journalism, literary criticism, <laughs> history. And we all know that truth is stranger than fiction. And so are tonight's nominees. <laughs> The nominees for Superior Achievement in Nonfiction are Jason V. Brock, Disorders of Magnitude. <laughs> S.T. Yoshi, Lovecraft and a World in Transition. <laughs> Leslie S. Klinger, The New Annotated H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> Joe Minart and Emma Audsley for Horror 101, The Way Forward. <laughs> Finally, Lucy A. Snyder for Shooting Yourself in the Head for Fun and Profit. <laughs> and the Stoker goes to... Oh, I already see. I already see. Lucy A. Snyder. Wow, uh, 
this is surprising. Thank you very much. Uh, there was a lot of really stiff competition in uh, this category. Um, I want to thank Postmortem Press, Eric, and the other staff there. Uh, I want to also thank uh, Nancy Kalanta uh, because a lot of the material started out as uh, my columns at Oral World. And I'd like to thank my first readers, Gary Ronbeck, Trista Robichaud, and Scott Slummons. Thank you, everybody. If you're an HWA officer like Lisa, you're probably pulling down a low six-figure salary. <laughs> Incentive bonuses can bring that up to maybe 150k, 175. Um, I'm not as well paid. I get about 80,000 plus a $5,000 bonus every time I mention our sponsor, Samhain Publishing, www.samhain.com. <laughs> but some crazy people volunteer for the organization, and that's who we honor with this next award, presenting the Silver Hammer Award. Please welcome the Chair of the Board of Trustees, Mark Simon. You really get $80,000? I don't know if this is working, but we'll try. It is. Okay, this is. The Horror Writers Association periodically gives a silver hammer to an HWA volunteer who has done a massive job amount of work for our organization. And I'm going to just say right now, this woman has, has been a cheerleader as well for HWA in so many ways. Um, and she's been often unsung and behind the scenes. It was instituted in 1996 and is decided by a vote of HWA's Board of Trustees. The award is so named because it represents the careful, steady, continuous work of the building, building HWA's house. The many institutional systems that keep the organization functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. The award itself is a chrome-plated hammer with an engraved plaque on the handle. The chrome hammer is also a satisfying allusion to the Beatles song, Maxwell's Silver Hammer, a miniature horror story in itself. This year, the board has voted to give the 2015 award to Rena Mason. Stoker Award winning author of The Evolutionist and East End Girls. She is an active member of the Horror Writers Association, International Thriller Writers, an affiliate member of the Mystery Writers of America, and the International Screenwriters Association. After graduating college in upstate New York with a SUNY nursing license, she practices in RN and oncology, home health care, and the operating room specializing in orthopedics. An avid scuba diver since 1988, she enjoys traveling in the world, but most of all, spending time with great friends and her pugs. <laughs> she currently resides in Reno, Nevada. The HWA is a success because of the tremendous workload carried on by our many volunteers, as I said, often mostly unnoticed. Rena is an exemplar of these efforts, and the board is pleased Everyone, I hope I hope you're having a great time, and I look forward to seeing you all next year in Las Vegas. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank Rocky and Lisa for encouraging and guiding me through too many things to list. Um, and also, the other members of the board for choosing me to receive this year's Silver Hammer Award. Many thanks to all the volunteers 
In particular, Jessica Landry for stepping in mid-year and doing a phenomenal job along with Patrick Freeball. I'd also like to thank Ron Bresnay for all his help and patience. It's a continual learning process, so I'd also like to thank this year's jurors and sheriffs for their patience, along with the head verifier, Karen Hanton. Uh, Kathy Potasic, Aaron Kemper, and the entire newsletter staff for doing an excellent job of putting it together and getting it out on time. It's a, it's a great resource, and if you're not reading it, you should be. I'd like to encourage other members to volunteer some of their time, if and when possible. I thank everyone in the HWA for their dedication to promoting the genre. I'd also like to thank my husband Rob, my son Garrett, and my son Parker for all of the dinners where we missed because I had I just have one more email to answer. Just just wait, just wait, I got one more. Last year I accepted this award for a dear friend and colleague Norman Rubenstein, who couldn't be here. I was I was really nervous about accepting the award for him. So I, I made a promise to keep his uh, speech short. And if any of you know Norm, you, you, and have corresponded with him, you know what I'm talking about. But since then, I, I feel like I've improved a little bit in, in this whole speech thing. So I would like to, uh, I asked him if it was all right if I could use his, his speech from last year. And he said, sure. So just <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. That's actually short for a Lord Rubens to speak. <laughs> Back at the World Horror Convention 1995, just because I thought it was amusing, I went around getting signatures on an HWA anthology that was not considered to be our finest project, which is how I met the legendary Charles L. Grant for the first and only time. So I'm now going to recreate for you the entirety of my conversation with one of the all-time greatest writers in the history of our genre. Death Port. <laughs> I knew there were a lot of Death Port fans, but I did this way. <laughs> Presenting your award for superior achievement in an anthology, please welcome the editor of Inslet Nightmares, joined by the editor of Psychos, Lois Gorsh and John Skip. We're going classy. Okay, so until uh, Jess Strand ruined everything by telling us that we couldn't dance on the stage or jump up and down without uh, knocking over these things, you've heard, and we uh, kind of put a damper on the proceedings because we have this elaborate thing whipped out. I was going to bring my bongos up. I was going to whip up a primitive rhythm that would have you all responding. Um, <laughs> while Lois did a provocative hula, hula kind of dance. Watch out, though, seriously. Yeah. There's a song that's on the floor. You feel anything that I would have to do, anything to happen. Yeah, it was going to be really weird, um, and I was going to sing a little song uh, about the wonders of the anthology. I was going to go, and who, and who, y'all are going to sing back some thing you'd make up. Uh, and it's, going to be really, it's going to be really exciting. It's going to whip you into a frenzy. You would all be doing eventually the, the dance around Conga Line around the entire place. Uh, in celebration of the anthology, and then the weird hand would come out of the middle of the table, and we go to the next scene. Um, but then I went, nah. <laughs> so uh, you want to just read the nominees and sure, I'll try. We'll get out of here? All right, but I'm going to say something. Oh, no, I'm not saying anything. Yeah, I'm not like, you made me do all this crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just made that up on the spot. So I'm going to make this up. I'm okay. making them up. These aren't really the people. I'm going to make them up. <laughs> Wow. All right, Verify. these may or may not be the nominees. Okay, oh great. Uh, Michael Bailey, 
with a Latin title I'm sure I can't pronounce. <laughs> God damn it. So uh, I'm sure you're going to be really excited to win for uh, Koalia Naus. Um, there you go. <laughs> Jason B. Brock, the dark down cast. Ellen Datlow, I swear I can pronounce pure bowl symmetries. <laughs> oh, Chuck Polonic, yeah. uh, Richard Thomas, and uh, Dennis Whitmire. We'll do it together. Bert Tom. Oh, <laughs> Bert Tom. Brett J. Holly. Linda's Inc. Book 2. And the winner is going to be? Oh, you get to say it. You may already be a winner. Wife, wife. Well, here, there were no anthologies in here. All right, you announce. who um, published it uh, at Cheesley. All the backers who had faith in Fearful Symmetry, as it was, most of you probably know, it was kick-started. Um, the contributors, of course. Um, the HW membership. And there was someone else I remember. <laughs> uh, and I knew I should have written it down. But anyway, uh, thank you, everybody. But, you know, I'm really honored. No, we do not have a better microphone. <laughs> we have an equal player. We have exactly the same microphone. <laughs> so, in the previously poor microphone, presenting the award for superior achievement in a fiction collection, please welcome the author of Concrete Savior, joined by the author of The Massacre of the Mermaids, Yvonne Navarro and Alessandro Manzetti. to be a writer and you, you start out you want to write that novel and you're like well you know it's kind of hard I'm, I'm going to try a short story first that ought to be easy yeah that ought to be easy not so easy and so even I think even more difficult is taking all those little not so easy parts and putting it into a cohesive collection because it's, it's not just taking a bunch of short stories that you think are good I mean it's and it's not even a theme, it's a feeling that runs through. It's, it's the ebb and the flow, and it's, it's all that works together. So just, just, I just wanted to point that out so that we can all really appreciate a fiction collection. Some good stories here. 
Excellent stories. Excellent stories. Steve Brown Jones, after the people rights have gone up. John Leader, Leader by Leader. Ellen Marshall, give for the one who comes after. Lucy Snyder, Soft of Calypsis. John Taft, The Hand is All Beginnings. A story of those two. Lucy Snyder, Soft of Calypsis. Uh, I really like to thank uh, John and Jennifer over at Raw Dog for publishing the book first of all, and I'd like to thank all of the editors who had faith in stories in the first place and published them in their various magazines and anthologies. And you know, thanks to my first readers, Gary Brownbeck, of course, um, and uh, Trista and Scott Slimmons, and uh, thanks to all of you. I really, really, really appreciate that you guys like the book. Thank you. Spargo Marathon is the only name I have ever screwed up. <laughs> and it's because I thought, oh, I've known her for 25 years. I don't need to double check. But I did that the first year I did this, and now it's all come full circle. <laughs> Our next category is the Richard Lehman Award. And this is my seventh year emceeing the Stokers. Richard Lehman died while serving as HWA president. And years one through five, I went up on stage planning to do a joke about how being HWA president can kill you. A joke I did with Kelly and Ann's permission. Years one through five, I walked up to the podium, picked up the microphone, and burst out. Year six, I finally did the joke, and the audience gave a resounding wince. So I just want to say in my own defense, Ann and Kelly were cool with it. Presenting the Richard Lane Awards, or awards, please welcome the president of HWA, Lisa Norton. You know, one of the pleasures of that six-figure salary I pulled in <laughs> is getting the slave drive a bunch of unpaid volunteers. <laughs> Actually, one of the great pleasures of this position is being able to recognize extraordinary dedication from volunteers. Uh, that's what the Richard Lehman Award is. It's a service award. This year, there was really no question for me about who to give it to. It was to our remarkable publicity team. I know Rocky stood in as much awe of them as I did. I think he would have loved this award. So without giving any more, uh, wasting your time, I want to pass this off to the people who deserve it. Doug Marano, Tom Kalin, and Brock Cooper. You, first of all, Lisa, for this tremendous honor. Your support and your guidance on a daily basis just make volunteering a tremendous pleasure. Um, thank you to the entire HWA. Um, I, I've never been part of a greater organization. Uh, you're full of life and friendliness and welcome, and uh, I, I'm really lucky to be a part of this group. Um, I also want to thank Tom and Brock, my team, mem my team members, and my fellow awardees for tonight. Um, you're tremendously talented. You fill in the gaps. Uh, you come with brilliant ideas and a lot of energy. And I couldn't be more thankful to work with both of you. Uh, I, I also want to thank uh, Rocky Wood, um, who I actually applied for a different volunteer position when I applied for a volunteer spot with the HWA for the first time. But uh, after conversing with me a little bit, 
he said, well, why don't you take the communications job? And uh, I did, and I'm, I'm so happy that I did. Um, Rocky, thank you for your mentorship and uh, your faith in us. And um, we miss you. Uh, and, and finally, uh, I want to thank my beautiful wife, Jessica, who's back there. Um, I, I love you. Next up is a brand new category for the Stokers, Mentor of the Year, which I originally misread as Dementor of the Year, and I thought, oh, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> Please welcome back to the stage the Mentorship Chair, Michael Lowe. I'm going to mention that you messed up my I did it on purpose as a joke, <laughs> which didn't land very well with that. <laughs> One of the most popular benefits of HWA membership is the mentorship program in which new writers are paired with established pros who offer them guidance for the work and also in the publishing industry itself, business. The HWA now is annually going to recognize the work of one mentor who has made an especially significant contribution. Uh, the HWA's men mentorship program chairperson and the program's committee select the awards recipient. Uh, the mentorship program is currently being overhauled and uh, we really need mentors. So if you would like to become a mentor, please uh, contact me or one of the others. Uh, when I started thinking about uh, Mentor of the Year Award, one person came to mind immediately, and that was Catherine Potasek. And I think being an old broadcaster, I've worked in radio for over 20 years, I like to make sure that I have the right pronunciation. And I was sending her mp3s to make sure that i was saying it correctly and i even called her on the telephone <laughs> and it is catherine okay I, just to make sure. <laughs> I went to it twice I, i've got another one probably so <laughs> kathy is an extraordinary example of someone willing to give of her time and talents she exhibits a selfless passion for helping writers find their way in an ever-expanding industry being a mentor doesn't mean that you have to have all the answers. It just means that you're willing to share what you know. And I think Kathy excels in this ability. And we are very fortunate to have her as an HWA, HWA member, uh, as a volunteer, and also as a uh, mentor. And I asked one of her uh, former mentorees uh, to say something, and, and uh, Celine McLeod, was mentored by her from 2012 to 13. And she says, I'm thrilled to hear Kathy won Mentor of the Year. No one deserves it more than she does. Don't let her friendliness and warm cat mommy persona fool you. <laughs> She's got a sharp editorial eye and a keen sense of story. And working with her helped me develop confidence in my work. She also talked me down when I was having a rough time with writing. And she encouraged me to pursue paying markets, a struggle all new horror authors have to face. She says, congratulations to Kathy for all the work that she's done and hope uh, to read more from her and uh, the fellow mentorees. So with that, I would like to say congratulations for the first Mentor of the Year Award to Kathy Potasek. So I have something to read from her, and she is, by the way, watching by the internet. So everybody say, hello, Kathy. Hello, Kathy. Hello, Kathy. Hello, Kathy. <laughs> she says, thank you to the HWA for giving me this, this award, and thank you very much, Michael Moss, for nominating me. 
I'm very honored to receive the first mentor award. I think mentoring, formally or not, is important to all writers and poets and artists. It's easy to get discouraged when you're a creative person, and it's good to have support, especially from someone in the field with experience. Also, it's crucial for the mentor to encourage you to expand your horizons, to try uncharted writing territories. She says, I was very fortunate to have a journalism professor at UNM who was incredibly encouraging and tough on me when I was starting out as a writer. I remember his support more than anything else that happened in those long ago years. He was also the first published novelist I had ever met, and I was just so impressed. Thank you, Tom Hillerman, for all your ex excellent words and criticism over the years. So I would like to say that if you have not volunteered for the HWA mentor program yet, please do. It's valuable for the mentor and the mentoree. You'll be learning while you're helping the other person, and that's something we can all uh, do to grow as writers. Plus, you might get a terrific friendship out of the deal as well. Thank you very much. Okay. The next category is screenplay, interior, Atlanta Marriott night. <laughs> the ballroom, the Bronx Stoker Awards have ended. So much death, <laughs> so much destruction. It was all shaky camp, so you couldn't actually tell what was happening, but we assure you it sucked. <laughs> John Skip, I'm where I to survive. No, no, you didn't see the hatchet in my belly. <laughs> Fade to black. <laughs> Believe it or not, that was not an excerpt from one of tonight's Stoker nominated screenplays. I wrote that myself just for this event. <laughs> because I care. Presenting the award for superior achievement in a screenplay, please welcome this year's World War Convention Grandmaster, joined by the creator of the series Carnival, William F. Moore and Daniel Knott. I've been blackmailed to be up here. I have no intention whenever of giving any awards to anybody. I wanted the only award for myself. Instead of that, I'm standing out there waiting for the doors to open. I'm an innocent person as I am, of course, loving and innocent. And suddenly, one of the representatives, I won't say who it was, but it looks a lot like this guy, came up to me and said, you're presenting the award for best screenplay. And I said, no, no, you go. You must be mistaken. I, I got, I'm the Grand Master. I'm just going to get that and then I'll sit down. Right <laughs> no, no, you got to present the award for best screenplay. And I said, I won't do it. <laughs> and he said, yes, you will. I said, I will not. He said, well, then we'll revoke your Grand Master <laughs> award and, and call it the Mediocre Master. <laughs> so I said, I'll do it. I'll do it. You're going to leave the nominee. I just want to say one thing about the, you know, the Horror Writers Association is any group of people that actually will hand a live mic to John Skip, <laughs> which is tantamount to handing uh, a loaded 357 Magnum to a four-year-old child. Is, this is my kind of group. <laughs> and nominated in Superior Achievement in the Screenplay, the nominees are Scott M. Gimbel, The Walking Dead, for the episode The Grove. Jennifer Kent, The Babadook. John Logan, Penny Dreadful, for the episode Sale. Stephen Moffat, for Doctor Who, the episode Listen. And James Wong, American Horror Story Coven, the episode, The Magical Delights, ah, The Magical Delights of Stevie Nicks. And the winner is Jennifer Kent, 
the Babadook. If Jennifer wants her award, she's going to have to come to my place. <laughs> it's not pleasant to talk about, but sometimes at the store we have issues with presenters who use inappropriate language and obscene gestures while up here on stage. And I was especially concerned when I saw who would be presenting two awards tonight. So you probably heard me breathe a deep sigh of relief off stage when there wasn't an earlier incident with Bart Simon. <laughs> so presenting the special group trust award, please welcome back to the stage the author of Dangerous Dreams, Bart Simon. Specialty Press Award recognizes a publisher outside the mainstream New York City publishing community that specializes in dark fiction. Winners are typically small presses specializing in limited editions, small print runs, or the work of a new and relatively unknown author. The winner of this award is determined by a majority vote of the HWA Board of Trustees. The recipient of the award of the 2014 specialty award is Cheezine Publications, founded and run by Brett Alexander Savory and Sandra Gasturi. Cheezine Publications sprang out of the successful Cheezine.com, which began presenting fiction and review in 1997. Since its inception in 2008, CDP has published more than 90 books. Their philosophy is to startle, to astound, to share the bliss of good writing with our leadership. Here to accept the award on behalf of Brett and Sandra are three of Chasing's authors, Christopher Goldman, David Nichol, and Rio Hewitt. <laughs> and by the way, I pronounced it Chasing because that's the way Sandra's pronounced it when she's talking. We got some of our here, so we're going to be like squinting through the whole thing. Let's sleep down, old man. David Stutz? Oh, you start. No, we can't. Get with the script, I'm just distracted by your, your outfit. <laughs> it's hellish, is what it is. Well, Brett and Sandra didn't, didn't throw us completely to the wolves. You know, they didn't write something for us here. Although we would kick some more glass if we had to. I got it. I got it, brother. I got it. For Brett and Sandra, I don't got it. <laughs> We would like to thank the HWA for this tremendous honor. It was completely unexpected, which makes it even more wonderful. In 2015, you want to round of applause here, Cheesy Publication will publish its 100th book. That is awesome. And we wouldn't have made it this far without the support of an army of freelancers, volunteers, staff, readers, friends, and colleagues like you, and one exceptional cover artist today, Eric Moore. We especially wouldn't have made it without having the phenomenal luck of somehow being able to trip, cajole, and strong arm some very talented writers <laughs> some, into, uh, oh, this is a small type. Um, Should I just do this thing? Oh, oh. Is that, is that word like that? I'm going to use my fingers to make things bigger. <laughs> that, no. <laughs> Into publishing with us. Put your mind away from there. For all of that, we are beyond grateful. We wish we could be there to accept the awards ourselves, but we are busily publishing and planning our next 100 books. By planning, of course, we mean sitting around drinking celebratory cocktails. But we are so pleased that 
Clive Barker, Stephen King, and Neil Gaiman could accept this award. <laughs> Thank you so much, H.W.A. Sometimes shorter is better. Presenting your award for superior achievement in short fiction, please welcome the author of Windhaven, joined by the author of Dark Art, Lisa Tuttle, and Tim Wagner. As you know, the, uh, the HWA has been very innovative in the way it's been approaching the awards in the, the last few years. And so for the short fiction category this year, they have decided to forego you know, actual voting and have a wrap on. So, you know, it's going to start the series, Epic Rap Battles of Horror, you know, find on YouTube soon. So if everybody would just, okay, maybe that's next year, so maybe it's next year, okay. So, would you like to go ahead and read the nominees? So the nominees for Superior Achievement in Short Fiction are Hal Bodner, Hot Tub. <laughs> Sydney Lee, Baby's Breath. <laughs> Usman T. Malik, The Vaporization Enthalpy of a Peculiar Pakistani Family. <laughs> Rena Mason, Rumination. John Palisano, Splinterette. <laughs> and Damien Angelica Walters, The Floating Girl. About to <laughs> the Staper goes to? Usman, Usman T. Malik. <laughs> Bailey for rejecting my story. <laughs> but later on, asking me if he could hold it for a science fiction horror anthology blend. I'd also like to thank my beta readers for this story uh, Chris Mars, Greg Faraday, or JG Faraday, and my editor, RJ Cavender. This one's a little short, but I could go down and get more in speech again if, if anybody. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm very grateful to be here. Um, I would like to thank lots of people. I don't have time for that. But I do want to thank my wife. She's sitting right there. Um, <laughs> she's been suffering me for the last three years as I delved into this strange world of publishing. And um, I want to thank Michael for taking the story, which was turned on by several markets, but he picked it up. And the story seems to have done well. And I want to thank Ellen Dadlow, who's been very helpful to me throughout my career. She's my teacher, my friend, and my editor uh, for several of her work. And I want to thank, uh, I will accept this award on behalf of Rocky Award, um, with whom I had some differences at some points. But I don't know a man with more integrity than Rocky. So I would take this on uh, in Rocky's name. Thank you very much. So I've been wondering why I've been pouting off stage all night. And I realize that with every award we hand out, that's one more person who has a stoker and I don't. 
Well, I made my own. <laughs> no, it's not as good. The door doesn't open, but it's the only thing keeping me from having a meltdown, so admire it. <laughs> Presenting the award for superior achievement in long fiction, please welcome the author of Beautiful Creatures, joined by the author of Westlake Soul, Tammy Garcia and Rio Lewis. So yeah, so uh, Lisa asked us to uh, come up with something that means that you can introduce the award um, to what you go. You said you were going to do that last night. Because you had a really free day today. Well, you said, you told us that you were going to do it. No, I was doing stuff today. Like, I had panels. You said, I had a free day. Remember you were drinking beer? <laughs> you said, I'm really funny and I totally got this. You look what did you do with by Sarah? I don't you know, like, I don't know, like, that's just not even to do with giving speeches. You said, you said, I remember I said, I got this. Relax, I got this, remember? You make me look like a jackass up here. I mean, you know. <laughs> but, but you did say you did. I got it, baby. Okay, ready? <laughs> can, can, am I allowed to look before? No. Oh, no, he's not impatient. He's winning. You will the superior achievement in long fiction. Or people who don't know how to wrap up a short story. <laughs> That's a good word because I'm going to tell this. Taylor Brown for the effective. <laughs> Eric J. Dunant for Dreams of a Little Suicide. Joe R. Lansdale for Fishing for Dinosaurs. <laughs> Jonathan Mabry for Three Guys Walking to a Bar. <laughs> Joe McKinney for Lost and Found. Let me see. Let me see. And the winner is Joe R. Lansdale for Fishing for Dinosaurs. <laughs> oh, and now I knew the stuff was favorite yeah. battle. Accepting for Joe Lansdale is Jason B. Brock. Joe wrote me the other night and he says, Listen, on the on the on the change that witness thing, will you go accept for me? And I said, uh, I think I'd do that. And I said, do you have anything you want to say? And he says, well, I'm probably going to win. But you know what? If you win, I'll be half as big as shit. And if I don't win, I'll be half as big on ground in. So just tell him something like that. And so, I guess he's happy as big as shit. It's all the truth. So, but Joe Lansdale, you know, his own self. Presenting the first of our two Lifetime Achievement Awards tonight is the man whose name is way harder to pronounce than his wife's, but I'll get this one correct, Weston Oaks, the author of Seal Team 6 Foot 6. Met Rob Lowe. I couldn't get over how timeless he looked. His hair was a shade darker and his smile was a degree or two wider, but it was definitely the same guy I'd seen at St. Elmo's Fire and Hotel New Hampshire groping rat pack actresses. And I think that Rob Lowe was also a horror author? Wow. Just wow. I mean, who knew? Call me a fanboy. And then some dumbass popped my bubble and told me the guy's name wasn't Rob Lowe, it was really Jack Ketchum. I said, that sounds like a fake name, too. I mean, Jack Ketchum? 
I asked, what if maybe this Rob Lowe looking guy wasn't actually the real Rob Lowe, just lying in the horror gutter, pretending to be Rob Lowe looking Jack Ketchum? <laughs> in fact, I was told that Jack Ketchum was a fake name, too. The Rob Lowe looking guy named Jack Ketchum's real name was Dallas Meyer, right? Dallas <laughs> Meyer. How many of you think that sounds like a fake name? <laughs> Dallas Meyer sounds like a Texas pork product. <laughs> Sounds like something you might eat along with the pickled eggs at the bar. <laughs> Dallas Meyer, my ass. <laughs> and I was right. You see, it turns out that Dallas Meyer isn't the only name he's gone by. Turns out that his real name is Jersey Livingston. <laughs> <laughs> for a considerable number of my formative years, I remember reading Swank as a kid, and for the life of me, I don't remember any words in that magazine. <laughs> Back to my hypothesis. Maybe this guy sitting here really is Rob Lowe pretending to be a horror author who just looks like Rob Lowe. <laughs> Can you see it? Let me point out the obvious. Jack Ketchum and Rob Lowe have never been in the same room together. <laughs> or have they? <laughs> Back to the Lifetime Achievement Award presentation. Here's how it works. To be eligible for this award, a candidate must be either be at least 60 years of age by May 1st of the year of the award's presentation, or must have first produced professional work in the field of horror at least 35 years prior to May 1st of the year of the awards presentation. All recipients must be alive at the time the president is informed of the committee's choice. <laughs> this guy checks all the blocks. <laughs> what the criteria doesn't say, but is certainly implied, is that the recipient must have had a significant impact on the genre. And that is definitely a block Dallas has checked with a giant marker. Look at this Rob Lowe lookalike. Beneath his craggy, whiskey-scented exterior, behind the shifty eyes, and hidden within his lean teenager's body is a nurturing soul. No, really, I swear. It's not so obvious. To think that the man whose mind created the girl next door is a nurturer is like having the good Rob Lowe and the bad Rob Lowe in the same body. I can remember when I first started writing back in 1997. I met up online with a group of other writers who would become known as the Cabal. Folks like myself, Rain Gray, John Abasic, Mikey Hyde, Brian Keane, all of us would be huddled in front of our respective computer screens as we texted in hushed characters in a solemn but now lost place known as the Horror Net chat room. On occasion, a real writer would come by. Folks like Ray Garden, Dick Lehman, Doug Clegg, Jeff Paul Wilson, Tom Carrillo would slide in and we'd shut our yammering to hear how it was to be a real writer. Jack Ketchum was one of these guys who would slide in and give us advice. Not that he needed to. He just wanted to. He was the same person as he, as he was online. He always offered an eager smile. He, was, he always acknowledged a fellow writer, even if that fellow writer hadn't published anything other than a letter to his mother. When asked for advice, he was quick and confident, bestowing everything one might need to know about the craft of writing and the, and the nature of surviving the publishing industry. He might look like the bad Rob Lowe right now, but he's always been the good Rob Lowe to us writers, scrabbling and scraping at the sheer wall of literary possibilities. One stultifyingly hot Nikon afternoon found me getting a leg up. I had my first mass market book contract and was writing Empire Assault for Bad and Books. While everyone else was outside in the quad loudly getting their drink on, as they do at Nikon, I was inside writing. I got to the point where I needed to take a walk and get my thoughts together. I went outside, strolled around the building through a parking lot, and ended up bumping into Dallas. Remember this? I said, I, he, he asked what I was doing and why I wasn't with the others partying. I said, I had a book due and I needed to get some pages done before I could party. He then asked about the book and I meekly said, it's a, it's a work for hire zombie book, as if work for hire was a disease. <laughs> he locked me in that stern, take no shit gaze he kept produced on a dime and asked, are you getting paid? I nodded. Is it a mass market book? I nodded. Then don't apologize. You're writing. They're partying. My guess is that you're going to, be keep, you're going to keep writing far longer than they're going to keep partying. <laughs> I never again felt bad about writing a work for hire book, and I always remember that it's the work, not the party, that makes a writer. The success I've had in my own career can definitely be directly attributed to the, the advice, mentorship, and friendship Jack Ketchum gave me and continues to give me, and I know I'm not alone. Here's what my good friend Brian Keene had to say. I received my first mass market contract at a convention. I was sitting at the hotel bar by myself, looking over when Dallas sat down next to me. He asked me to buy him a drink and let me see the contract. I did. He then asked the bartender for a red pen. 
Soon he was going over the contract, adding things, crossed numbers out, all while not spilling a drop of that drink. When, when he was finished, he had the contract back to me and said, that's how you negotiate a contract. Keep a copy of this and use it as a template. That contract was for the book called The Rising, and I have used Dallas's template on every book ever since. I asked Monica O'Rourke if she had anything to say. No, she's been a long time confident and co-conspirator. She said, do you mean something I can say in public? <laughs> something that doesn't involve alleged sex, alleged drugs, and tons of booze? Notice we didn't use alleged with booze. <laughs> and I said, yes, something we can say in public and something that doesn't involve alleged sex, alleged drugs, and tons of booze. So after six months of thinking about it, no, seriously, Monica thought about it, and after lots of tears and wringing the pants, she provided this. Dallas has always been one of my most critical readers, and while I didn't quite appreciate it at the time, I sure do now. When Dallas read something I'd written, I wanted glowing praise, not, here's what you should have done with the ending, or, no, if you plug up that orifice with metal blood, we'll, we'll come out here, not here, this is how I know. <laughs> I don't know how to overcome the horrifying fact that Dallas doesn't consider me the next Hemingway. I dreamed of ways to convince him I was brilliant, but most of my ideas involved chloroform and lobotomy. Then, a few years ago, Dallas read something I'd written and had nothing but nice, nice things to say about it. Of course, I convinced myself he was just being kind, but isn't that the sort of stupid thing we writers tend to do? Especially when you find, f finally manage to listen to the advice and apply what your literary idol has been telling you for all these years. Even Stephen King recognized Jack Ketchum's contribution to the, to the great literature. When I asked Steve for a comment about Rob Lowe, I mean Dallas, he said, Beginning with off-season some 30 years ago, Dallas Meyer, writing as Jack Ketchum, almost single-handedly created a new form of horror suspense fiction, marrying true crime to the horror genre, and adding an unflinching realism that few other writers had the chops or the guts to equal. His stories are not for the faint-hearted and were never intended for them. His ability to create gripping situations and indelible characters is unparalleled. As you can see, this man has definitely made an impact on the industry. He's always been easy to approach. He takes time out of his day to help new and old writers alike. And oh yeah, somewhere along the way, he helped create a whole new subgenre. <laughs> yes, he did that. I'm pleased to call Dallas my mentor and friend, just as good as you are. So, Mr. Rob Lowe or Jack Ketson or Dallas Meyer or Jersey Livingston or whoever the hell you are, <laughs> please allow me to present to you the Four Writers Association's Lifetime Achievement Award. There are many ways to Thank you. Uh, God, thank you all. Um, you've been doing this as long as I have, and you could thank uh, hundreds of people, uh, uh, from editors to uh, to friends, uh, to lovers, to informants, um, uh, to cats. <laughs> uh, there are a couple of people I sort of want to uh, pick out in particular. Um, I think. At least one of them is here tonight, and, and that's Don Dory at Leisure, who kept my books. There he is. He kept my, he kept my books in print for a hell of a lot longer than anybody else ever had before. And as we all know, in print is the name of the game. If they can't get the book, the book ain't there. Um, the other one, I don't think he's here, but he was supposed to be, is Dave Hinchberg at uh, Overlook Connection Press. Uh, Hinch. Um, gave uh, a whole new life to the girl next door. It was just a drop dead piece of junk that Warner's threw out the market. And he got and he enlisted Stephen King to write the introduction to it, give it a hardcover edition, and that it was a whole new life for that book. And that's probably the most best known of my books that maybe all season. Uh, so I want to thank Dave for doing that. Um, my webmaster, Kevin Kovalin, he's been calling me every day, maybe once at least, a day, usually three or four times a day, uh, for the past 15 years. So I want to thank him. Um, he's been a great co-conspirator. And then uh, two women who I have to mention. Uh, my agent, Alice Martell, 28 years with this woman. I think, you know, I was... 
I was once an agent. We were looking for check number five. Uh, so that's pretty amazing. And finally, um, her name is Paula White. She's been my lifetime partner for 45 years. Uh, she's my first best reader. Um, I wouldn't be here without her. No way. I guess I'd like to say something about the convention in a way. Um, all the time I've been here, I haven't turned on the television once, I haven't been to a computer once, I've just been talking to people, uh, old friends, making new friends, um, uh, trying to communicate, uh, trying to talk to them and let them you know, listen to them. And, and uh, it occurred to me that that's so much better than, than my normal everyday life when I do turn on the computer and I just see words on a, on a screen. Uh, this is really special uh, because we're reaching out to one another. Um, I'm reaching to you, you're reaching to me. And it occurs to me that's really the same thing that writers do all the time. We, we, we try to communicate, we reach out. And I guess I want to thank you all for all these years of letting me reach out to you. Thanks. Presenting our second Lifetime Achievement Award tonight, please welcome an author and journalist whose many anthology appearances include A Hundred Twisted Tales of Torment and the Mammoth Book of Dracula, Mandy Slater. Good evening. I first met Tannis Lee at the 1984 World Fantasy Convention in Ottawa, Canada, where, where she was one of the guests of honor for that year. I was a teenager at the time, attending my very first World Fantasy Convention, all courtesy of my mother, who thought the convention would bring a shy girl like me out of my shell. Apparently it worked. Among the piles of books that I bought with me that weekend to get signed was a copy of the dual books paperback of the Silver Medal Mother by Tana. The convention itself was a whirlwind of meeting famous writers, parties, being raided by the Royal Mounted Police, and other typical convention adventures. I'm sure we've all experienced something similar this weekend. I remember being blown away by the outfit Tanith wore at the World Fantasy Banquet. She arrived in medieval garb, complete with a chainmail headpiece. I later learned that her ensemble caused ripples of horror from the World Fantasy Board as she had dared to show up at this serious event in costume. For some reason, this made the teenage me admire her even more. Tanith has always been a risk taker, never more so than in her fiction. Her incredibly prolific career has spanned more than 90 novels and over 300 short stories in the science fiction, fantasy, and of course, horror genres. In fact, her first professional sale was to the ninth volume of the often controversial Pan Book of Horror series, then edited by Herbert Van Thau. More than 45 years later, her superb, sh superb short stories continue to appear in anthologies and magazines on both sides of the Atlantic. In fact, her most recent collection, The Retrospective Blood, 20 Tales of Vampire Horror, only appeared a couple of months ago from Telos Publishing. Tanith has even flirted with television, scripting two episodes of the classic science fiction series, Lake Seven, along with four radio plays for the BBC. Over the years, I've bumped into Tanith at numerous conventions and publishing events, and we've had the pleasure of socializing on a number of occasions. Ever since that first time I met her back in Ottawa, I have always been awed by her talent, her wit, and her elegance. In 1980, Tanith Lee became the first woman ever to win a British Fantasy Award. In 2009, she was awarded the World Horror Convention's Grand Master Award, and in 2013, she was justifiably presented with the World Fantasy Convention's Lifetime Achievement Award. The last time I saw Tanit and her husband, John Gahane, was at the World Fantasy Convention in Brighton. She accepted her award wearing a lovely black jacket covered in white skulls, proof that she has never turned her back on her horror roots. And so it is with my great honor to announce Tanith Lee 
as a recipient of this year's Horror Writers Association Bram Stoker Award for Lifetime Achievement. Very sadly, Tanith cannot be with us tonight, but she sent me a brief but very sincere word to read out on her behalf to all. The award is a great and thrilling honor. I write because I love writing. Being slightly dyslectic, I didn't learn to read until I was eight and started writing at nine. I have never stopped since. That gives you an idea of how important writing has been for me. So if I get the other great award, that people like and value my work, it is truly the cherry on the cake. Aside from this, I am astounded by the company I have been placed alongside. It is the most wonderful gift. Thank you. It has made my year, Tanith Lee. This category is graphic novel, and all I have to say on that matter is, there's an Archie zombie comic. <laughs> when Archie has zombies, our genre has won the cultural awards. <laughs> Presenting the award for superior achievement in a graphic novel, please welcome an artist who is so esteemed that he's had an asteroid named after him, joined by the author of Invin Invisible Fences, Bob Eggleton and Norman Prentice. comic books when I was a kid back in the day with great titles like eerie and creepy and things like that. I'd hide them in my bed and I had my dear and now dead aunt Shirley saying to me things like, where's that ever going to get you in life? <laughs> well, here I am. Anyway. I was chair of the graphic novel jury this year and have worked on that, uh, the jury for that for several years. And I uh, just want to say right now, just thanks to everybody I've served on the jury with, and thanks for all the readers on the different committees, because it's it can be a big task. So I think I lucked out, because I love comics too, and that's where I, I grew up, like loving horror from reading Creepy and Eerie. Uh, so so it, was, it was a joy, um, and really a lot of good stuff this year. Um, I guess we would uh, read the nominees for the Superior Achievement graphic novel. I can use my scary voice. If you must. All right, this is my scary voice. But <laughs> I saw it. Emily Carroll, Through the Woods. <laughs> Joe Hill, Lock and Key. <laughs> Joe R. Lansdale and Danielle Sarah, I tell you it's love. <laughs> Jonathan Mabry, Bad Blood. <laughs> Paul Tobin, The Witcher. <laughs> and it goes to... Jonathan Mayberry. <laughs> So composing the email to Joe Hill, um, I for weeks have been saying that that and I'm a big fan of Lock and Key. That's an amazing comic, and Joe wrote I think one of the best comics ever. That said, uh, I am so delighted to receive this. Bad Blood was uh, a, a real labor of love. It was a, a comic that I wanted to write for a long time. And then I had the great benefit of working with a fantastic editor, Daniel Chapin, at Dark Horse, and an amazing artist, Tyler Crook, an Eisner award-winning artist, who not only did the pencils, but did the inks, the colors, the lettering, and the covers. So, I mean, he, he just did an amazing job with that comic. Uh, and I'm so thankful. And uh, I want to thank, as always, Sarah Jo, my wife, because she puts up with me for all my reasons. Thank you so much. Okay, 
as you can see, we are down to three trophies left. Presenting the award for Superior Achievement in a Young Adult Novel, please welcome the author of The Cure, joined by the author of Tin Men, J.G. Therity, and Christopher Gold. In order to write great YA fiction, a person needs to think like a teen, to put their self in the mindset of a teen. Petulant, sarcastic, overly dramatic, prone to tantrums. Now it all makes sense. <laughs> no, um, honestly, Greg and I were talking about this and I really feel like um, it makes a huge difference to me that the young adult category exists, especially because uh, so, so often it's dismissed as uh, young adult books are thought of as kids' books. And more and more we're coming to realize that uh, often enough they're more sophisticated, more mature, and more human than a lot of books written for adults. So, without further ado, the nominees are Jake Bible, International Haunting, Intentional Haunting. John Dixon, Phoenix Island. Cammy <laughs> Garcia, Unmarked, The Legion Series Book Two. <laughs> Tanya Hurley, Passionaries. <laughs> and Peter Adam Solomon, All Those Broken Angels. And the winner is John Dixon, Phoenix Island. For half a second, I thought about faking the stumble. She was really, really bad. This is um, the first time I've ever won anything without getting punched in the face. <laughs> so uh, I'm just so incredibly thankful to all of you and so many of you. I'm looking out at people who have just been such a big help throughout the long, long time that I've been writing. Um, specifically, though, I do want to thank my agent, Christina Hogarty. I'd like to thank my editor at Gallery Books, Adam Wilson, and everyone at Gallery Books, especially for throwing them copy of Phoenix Island in everybody's bag. Really great. Um, I'd like to thank Swaya Nightingale, one of my first critique partners. Sydney Lee, without whom I would not have um, gone through all the hoops and stuff to, to actually get here. And especially Tim Wagner, uh, who was my mentor for this book. He encouraged me. He led me through it all. He encouraged me also to submit Phoenix Island to the jury, everything. And finally, my wife, Christina, I couldn't do any of this without her. Thank you so, so much. This year, the Bob Stoker Awards added another 52 categories. <laughs> Hopefully, you are all informed of this beforehand and have planned the rest of your evening accordingly. Presenting the award for superior achievement in reappropriation of public domain material, please welcome, no, Lisa's saying no. So, I guess we're saving that for a different banquet. So, instead, presenting the award for superior achievement in a first novel, please welcome the author of Flesh Eaters, joined by the author of Dracula of the Undead, Joe McKinney and Dager Stoker. Hey, Baker, how's the uh, convention going so far? I have to say, this is wonderful. The reception is great. The honor of Brad is great. But this is very confusing for me. This is like, I'm, I mean, all seriousness, it's like a family reunion where everybody's yelling, Stoker here, Stoker there. Like, <laughs> I know some of the faces, but I forget all the names. Or my wife invited you all here, and I don't know who the hell you guys are. 
But it's, you know, and I was at the bar and heard this one guy say, oh, I'm up for a stoker. I said, which one are you up for? My daughter? <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> like, You've got some stokers, right? I mean, I may have a couple, but you've got real stokers. Well, I, yeah, I've got two. Wait, yeah. Tell me about the two. I mean, come on. Uh, well, flesh eaters and, and dog days. So, so not the real flesh, the story flesh. Wrong, right, right. right. Yeah. Well, how about you? How many do you have? I've got three at home. Jenny, Bell, and Parker are very proud of this. Well, I guess the question is which one is going to be the Let's not get into that. Let's, let's actually give them some of these. Oh, oh okay, these guys. okay, okay. All right. All right, so uh, up for uh, superior achievement in a first novel, uh, Maria Alexander, Mr. Wicker. <laughs> J.D. Barker for second. <laughs> David Cronenberg, consumed. Michael Nost, Return of the Mothman. Did I pronounce Michael right? <laughs> Josh Mallerman, Bird Box. <laughs> and, the and the winner is Maria Alexander. <laughs> as writers, right? Talk about all the terrible things that we do to them. Uh, a TV writer I know, Gillian Horvath, she calls them, she says, we give our characters wygasms. <laughs> you guys are so mean. <laughs> and for me, I mean, we, I tend to think of what my characters do to me. And what they do for me. And Mr. Wicker saved my life. In late 1997, I was going through a really terrible time. I had lost use of my hands. I was disabled. I had no money. I was really in good shape. You'd want to date me. And, <laughs> and this character walked into my life, and, um, and he saved it. Came to me as a first as a short story. So my first big thank you actually is to Neil Gaiman, because at the time he was reading a lot of my short stories. We've been friends for a long time, and he read that short story and he said, well, "You know, this is really an adult fairy tale, and things happen in threes. So I think the main character Alicia Baum needs to see Mr. Wicker a third time." And Neil Gaiman is so right, always. <laughs> Just so you know. And I said, you're right. So then I made it into a screenplay. And the screenplay was recognized by the Nickel Fellowship. It placed very highly. It's a very prestigious uh, screenplay competition. And, um, but Hollywood didn't get it because they didn't understand dark fantasy. They understood Clive Barker and they understood Tim Burton. But they didn't get anything in between. So it didn't go anywhere. But I thought, you know what, this is, is going to make a good book. And so I did. And I have so many people to thank, including Jody Luster, who was one of my first editors <laughs> of the book. Um, my many beta readers, uh, beta readers of both the screenplay and the novel, um, Sean Dixon, Dickinson, um, Adam Campbell, Davy Snively, this filmmaker, and the late Rebecca Owen, who the book is dedicated to. And, uh, 
but most of all, I'll to also to uh, Dr. James Moskovich, who helped me with the historical fiction section of it. Um, but really, the big thanks goes to Jennifer Barnes and John Lawson of Raw Dog Books for saying, yeah, we want this book. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see how great they are because of all the little brown houses sitting on that table. <laughs> uh, with Lucy. Um, yeah, I, I'm so grateful, so grateful to all of you for voting and for thinking so highly of Mr. Wicker. I mean, this, this award is for all of us. I mean, for Josh, for JD, for, um, oh my God, for Michael, for David. I was going to say, I didn't want to say David Cronenberg, like David, you know, David, you know. So, um, but it is for all of us because there were so many good books, and I just feel amazingly honored. So, thank you. We are down to the final category. But before that, please give a huge round of applause to all the volunteers who worked so hard to make this a great game. <laughs> Thanks to Jody and Dave Lester, who had to stand in front of you the entire time. If you are a winner tonight or accepted for one of the winners, you have to report right here immediately after the ceremony for pictures. That then will be taking lots and lots of pictures of you. The after stover party is in room 918, that's the hospitality suite. And tomorrow at 9 a.m. is breakfast with the stover winners. So if you win, you have to get up early, so keep the party in the room. No, no. <laughs> Sorry, I don't make the rules, I just enforce them. And that's in Dunwich. And now the final award of the night, presenting the award for Superior Achievement in a Model. Please welcome the creator of Stuckey Stack House, Charlene Harris. for my warm welcome uh, at this convention. I've never been to uh, a horror writer's convention before, except for Nikon, which I don't think was representative. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a wonderful time, and I very much appreciate the warmth and hospitality and the intelligence in panels and in comments in panels that I've encountered. Uh, that's not, I'm not surprised, but I'm delighted. <laughs> I've been to conventions where that wasn't uh, the norm. <laughs> Superior Achievement in a Novel. The nominees are Craig DeLouis, Suffer the Children. <laughs> Patrick Freibald, Jade Sky. <laughs> Chuck Palinuk. Beautiful you. Christopher Rice, The Vines. Steve Rasnick Tim, Blood Tim. Steve Rasnick Tim. Friend Steve could not be here tonight, but he did send me a few words to read on his behalf. Like too many of my novels, Blood Kin took me years to finish. No, I'm not recommending the practice. 
Sometimes my writing methods are a mixture of procrastination, insecurity, and the puzzling need to start something brand new while something old is begging for that crucial next scene. Melanie used to call it my creative virus and would help me find ways to control the symptoms. But somehow the book got finished, in part because my Solaris editor, Jonathan Oliver, wanted to read it. So I'm thankful to him and to you for honoring the book this way and, of course, to Melanie, my love. In its wisdom, the HWA has designated that these awards are for superior achievement, not best of. This is an important distinction to me. I don't know about you, but I often puzzle over award ballots, wondering how anyone could choose between A, B, or C when each of the examples seems both distinctive and accomplished. I'm very much aware that given a slightly different set of circumstances, it could be Craig DeLuy receiving this award, or Patrick Freiwald, or Chuck Palahniuk, or Christopher Rice. I hope you'll read more of their work. I hope you'll read more of mine. Thank you. And that is it. See you in Las Vegas for Stoker Pond 2016.